So yeah, I'm Jeff. I'm finishing my PhD at uh, the University of Queensland, and I'll be talking today about how we can do systematic conservation planning in R using the Prioritizer package. Um, so before we get into it, I'd first like to um, have a shout out to all members of the development team, Richard Schuster, Joe Bennett, Matt Stamasmacki, Peter Arcees, Nina Morell, Hugh Tossing, and Matt Watts. And I'm also thrilled to be talking about a case study that um, has used Prioritizer, um, which is some work that Marie Jade has been doing at UQ. So, as I'm sure you're aware, around the world, species are going extinct, you know, um, things are not looking so good. So a central question in conservation is, how should we manage areas to achieve conservation? And you might think, well, that's a pretty straightforward question, but there's a lot of variables. Um, so when we talk about we, what group is actually trying to implement this? What kind of legislative ability do they have? What resources do they have? When we talk about manage, what kind of management actions are we talking about? Protected areas, um, pest control, areas, what kind of specific geolocality are we talking about? What's our measure of success? And what are we trying to conserve? So there's lots of different ways of um, framing these kinds of problems. So to try and give you like a, a short introduction, let's pretend that you are in charge of managing a island with an island network. So each of these different circles represents a different island, and on each of these islands we have different populations. So elephant populations, uh, donkey populations, butterfly populations. And we're going to see if we can come up with a plan for this. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so how do we go about doing that? So we need to actually decide what we want to do. So you might have a specific uh, objective, which is I want to maximize our benefit subject to a budget. So, you know, if, you're, if your benefit was I want to get the most number of populations, which um, islands would you select for that? And if we had a budget, let's say we've got four islands. So which four islands would you protect in order to get the most number of populations? Well, this might be the optimal solution. You're getting the most number of populations for four islands. But that's treating each population equally. If you really valued threatened species, you might you know, value the elephant a bit more, in which case you know, there's no additional benefit whatsoever if all the other species are doing fine. But this is just one way of framing the problem. You might say, well, we want to come up with a plan that secures biodiversity. And so we have this idea of a, a, a solution that will persist indefinitely, but it's the, um, it achieves our objectives for minimal cost. So here, let's say you wanted to get one population of each species, and maybe that would be your target. And so then you want to minimize cost. So you say, OK, well, then these three islands achieve that. We get one of each population for minimum number of islands. Yeah? But then it's a lot more complex because biology and economics and this kind of stuff makes things a bit more tricky. We might have to make sure that our reserve network fits within the constraints of existing protected areas. There's no point you know, protecting extra populations of species that are already doing well or already in protected areas, well, to some extent. Um, we might have to consider in marine settings um, what the ocean currents are doing. If we're trying to preserve reefs, we need to make sure that we know we're, we're protecting reefs that are connected and all that kind of stuff. Um, we might have to consider what's happening with, um, if we have other people using the area. So if there's recreational fishing or commercial fishing, we need to make sure that our plan um, works with them as well, it works with other stakeholders, because otherwise it's probably not going to be implemented and that's not really useful then. Um, we might also have to consider um, the fragmentation. So if you look at the middle panel with the yellow plan and the purple plan, the purple plan um, consists of fewer grid cells, but it may not be that useful because it's very fragmented. So if this was a plan that needed patrolling, so you, know, you had to have people patrolling these areas to um, keep um, you know, recreational fishermen out, then that's not really viable. I mean, there's no way you, know, you could have a patrol team you know, going to all the different purple grid cells. And so you might be willing to trade off against having a few more grid cells if it means it's a lot more spatially clustered, like the yellow plan. And then we also have things like gene flow as well, where we don't just care about the endpoints, but we also need to care about how individuals are moving across the landscape. So there's lots of really complex things that go into this. And we have to worry about what our decision type is. Are we talking about protecting an area or not? Or different quantities, like trapping intensity, or um, that kind of stuff, or different management zones. So in fishing areas, you might have a no take, a partial take, and a full take where a partial take is you might allow certain levels of fishing um, to a certain extent. And then finally, once you've framed the mathematical problem, you have to think about, well, how am I going to solve this? You know, you've got the data, you've got the, the formulation, and then you have to solve it. And so we have conservation-specific tools, and there's um, wonderful tools from computer science that do this as well. Like, what, what do you use? So with Prioritizer, we tried to bring all this together, and we wanted to focus on two things, designing a problem. So we wanted to provide people the ability to, to design the problem that they have, 
and then solve it fast. So this is kind of how we've, um, we've conceptualized the idea of a conservation planning problem. We have like data on areas that we want to, um, that we want to manage or in data on biodiversity. We've got an objective, constraints, penalties, what kind of decision are we making, and then some kind of solving software. And we want to bundle it all together and then somehow get a solution from that. So this is kind of the mental model that underpins the, um, the package. And this is what the code might actually look like. So we start off with defining a problem using data on areas or our features. These could be spatially referenced data sets or um, just data frames. Um, then we add in functions to specify our objectives, our targets, our penalties, uh, what kind of decisions we're making and how we're going to solve it. And then once we've added all that, we've completed all the information, we can then solve it um, using a solve function, which is quite nice. I, I like it at least. Um, so to kind of walk you through this process, here's a short um, kind of example um, using Tasmania. That's a state in Australia. Um, it's the kind of one in, in the south um, in an island. Um, and so we have some different hexagons, and we're interested in working out which hexagons should we conserve if we want to manage um, different vegetation types. So grasslands, forests, rainforests. And to make things a bit more interesting, we also have um, some cost data as well. So basically the bluer areas cost less and the yellow areas cost more. So we could frame a problem where we say, okay, well, we've got our, our planning unit data, so those are the hexagons. We've got our feature data, which is our, um, our vegetation data. So those are like raster stacks and um, spatial polygons data frames, if you know what that means. Um, and then we specify the cost. And so then we frame our objective, our targets, our, our decision type, which means basically it's an on or off, yes or no. Um, we can customize the solver behavior. So we use integer programming, which means you get to control how close to optimality your solution is, which is you know, really important. There's no point getting a solution and then having no idea how good it is, or at least in my opinion. Um, and then we can solve that. And so this is what that solution might look like. But because it's kind of like this kind of builder um, paradigm, it's very easy to, in oh, oh, what happened there? Oh, OK. Um, OK, right. So we might also have, um, we might want to modify this. So in Tasmania, we already have protected areas in the region. So we want to make sure that our plans complement that and build on it. We don't want to pretend, that, like, there's no point in pretending they don't exist when adding to these plans. So we can add in this new element and then solve it again and get a new solution like that. Um, and then you can also say, well, we might have some areas where we can't actually do conservation. So we'll make sure that there's no point in putting forward a plan which says we should do conservation here because that's just not going to happen. And so you can iteratively add, um, you know, add and customize your problem to be exactly what you want, which I kind of like. Um, and so you can solve that now and you get a different solution that's slightly different. Um, you might say, well, it doesn't really make sense to have a kind of yes or no on or off kind of idea. Maybe because these are such large areas, it makes more sense to treat it more as like a relative amount of conservation. Like, how much should we focus on different areas? And so we can see um, some places we don't really need to focus very much, but some places we actually do need to focus quite a lot. And so again, it's very easy just to, to change out different elements of the problem. Um, and we can also change our objective too. So here, for example, um, before we had a minimum set kind of idea, but you know, maybe that just costs too much. It's just that, like, we need so much resources in order to achieve that. We just couldn't do it. So what if we have a fixed budget? We can say, well, just ma conserve as many different vegetation types as possible um, relative subject to this budget. And this is kind of at the point where you might change to another like entirely different piece of software because it's a very radical paradigm shift. It's like going from like a scatter plot to a bar plot kind of if you're talking about graphics. Um, but kind of but the way prioritizer works, it kind of has a general um, way of representing the math. And so you can swap in and out these different um, different problem types. Um, and we can also move to, from a single zone problem to a multi-zone problem. So before it was like a conserve or not idea, but you might have different management actions or zones. So you might have like a, a, a no take, a partial take, or a full take kind of zones for controlling fishermen. Or you might have different conservation actions, like you might have um, trapping or um, you know, different intensities of that. Um, and, find, and also you can solve it fast. So here is a global prioritization that involves um, 1.5 million uh, 10 by 10 kilometer pixels, um, 22,000 species, um, the global data set of protected areas in green, and we're able to come up with a prioritization, so a solution that would adequately conserve um, all of those 22,000 species in 76 minutes using this software. Um, and also Garobi as well, if you know what that means. Um, but essentially, um, you can solve really big problems really quickly, um, and that's really cool. And so I'm also going to talk about a case study. So 
Um, Marie Date at UQ has been using Prioritizer um, in her own work, and I'm thrilled to be able to chat about some of the stuff she's been working on here. So we had this idea in conservation that um, people derive benefits from nature. So if you have a park, you might get different services from it. So you might get carbon storage, so trees store carbon, that's good for abating or you know, helping with climate change. So if you have more trees, we're getting this kind of ecosystem service. But we also have services like nature interactions. So you can actually, you know, you get um, health and psychological benefits from interacting with nature. You get social interactions. So parks provide places for people to, you know, interact with each other in relaxation and exercise. And so Marie was interested in understanding, well, how, given, all, given, given a park, how do you, um, how can you, change different elements of the park to enhance these services. So, for instance, um, you know, you could add more trees to the park and that would give you more carbon storage. But that might be at the cost of, say, um, say exercise because you're removing grass. Or, you know, you could add a footpath and that might be good for exercise, but that might be at the cost of nature interactions. And so when you change an element of a park, you, um, you, you can enhance one ecosystem service, but that could be at the cost of another one. And so how could you implement um, these actions in a way that boosts a lot of the different ecosystem services, optimally? So what she did was um, she went out and mapped carbon storage across um, all of the parks in um, Brisbane. And so basically the dark green areas are bigger parks with more trees. And so you can see basically the biggest parks have the most trees, yeah? Um, we also have uh, cultural services. I don't have time to get into how she mapped that um, now, but basically she was um, able to produce maps showing um, the different benefits that people derive from relaxation and exercise and social interactions um, and all that stuff um, in each of the parks across uh, the Brisbane area. And so here we're just looking at like the sum of that. So what this is showing is the biggest parks closest to the center of Brisbane, where that black dot is, are where we get the most cultural services. So there's a big park there and it's, like, it's, it's kind of hard to see, but just um, trust me on this. If you look right, um, if you squint at the black dot, there's this ring of um, very bright red parks because that's basically in the center of Brisbane where all the people are accessing these parks. So parks that are um, further away from like, the, the most populated areas get lower colors because they're provisioning um, less people. And so she was interested in coming up with a plan that you could, so which actions did you implement in which parks to boost these services? So here was one plan that she came up with, um, which was able to, which would potentially boost carbon storage by 5%, which, you know, maybe that's not so much, but um, by strategically um, allocating um, different facilities in different parks, in different locations, um, she was able to come up with a plan that would boost cultural services by 88%. Um, and that's really cool, like, you know, I, or at least I think so. Um, you know, the fact that you can, with a well-defined um, data set and a well-defined model and problem come up with a way that um, actually enhances the benefits people get um, from their cities and is a kind of like next level city planning kind of idea. So another way of visualizing this, oh wait, sorry, so what we can see here is um, basically the general strategy seems to be add more trees in places where there's um, less people, so further out west and where places where there are people um, basically just add lots of infrastructure to make them more accessible. So more playgrounds, more footpaths, more barbecues, that kind of stuff. So generally adding more grass is, is, is a bad idea if you can do other things instead. Um, but it's still a work in progress. So this is um, like, I'm not saying you should actually do this if anyone here is from the Brisbane City Council. <laughs> so, um, so another way of visualizing this kind of plan is so um, if we were to simulate what happens if you implement those actions, we could see that you would basically increase um, carbon storage capacity across all of the parks. So we get bright green everywhere in all the parks. Um, but we see the cultural services, it's a very, um, very strategic. Um, it's not just like, okay, let's do this everywhere. Okay, thanks. It's not, we, we don't just do the, uh, this everywhere, we do it in um, specific places. So it's, it's kind of cool like that. Um, so what are we looking to do next with Prioritizer? Um, we're working on a shiny interface, so Richard Schuster's um, leading development on that. Um, a lot of the really cool stuff for Prioritizer, um, you kind of need uh, commercial solvers like a Ruby. Um, so we're looking to see if we can make the open source stuff quicker. And we're always looking to add more customization, so more objectives, constraints, and penalties. Um, and if anyone thinks that it's missing anything, please uh, post an issue on GitHub or email me and we'll see what we can do. Um, so here are some just interesting links. There's a GitHub repository. Um, there we have a teaching repository where we have workshop materials and um, slides for this talk and other talks and 
there's your uh, obligatory package down website. Thanks. So we have time for a couple of questions for Jeff. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, um, has anyone really done anything outside of conservation with this um, in, in, in any other field? Um, not really. Um, so Prioritizer, we haven't really put out a paper for it yet, so a lot of the people who are using it are just because they know me or know other members of the dev team. Um, but there's been, um, one of the case studies we're looking at is trying to um, optimally manage expansion of agricultural areas, um, but also considering biodiversity alongside, so how can you plan for the expansion of like agricultural areas in the next five years, but also consider um, you know, the fact we need to maintain habitat for species. But that's kind of like, we started that last month, so. <laughs> Yeah. I think it's a hard problem, but I'll just be interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, so the question was um, why, so there's, a lot, there's this really cool package called OMPR, which is a lot more flexible, kind of low-level interface for constructing um, integer programming problems. What's the benefit of this specific interface? Um, so a lot of people who do conservation don't really have a strong mathematical background, um, and that might change in the future, but that's kind of what it is at the moment. And so. Prioritizer offers a kind of more high level summary, I guess. Um, so if you basically pick the building blocks you like, you can kind of build the problem you want to solve. Um, whereas with um, OMPR and things like that, you have to have a very good understanding of exactly the mass that you want to, um, you want to employ to build your problem. So unfortunately, we don't use OMPR in Prioritizer. Um, maybe that might change in the future, but it's uh, mainly driven by RCPP um, to construct the problems and then um, Grobi or um, CoinOR to solve it. So, thanks. Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, if I answered correctly, the question was, um, can we apply decision trees and kind of machine learning techniques to this kind of stuff? Right, so I think the difference between like machine learning and like kind of optimization is, so let's have a look at um, this map kind of here. So you might have a ton of data on a few parks and you might then use machine learning to try and fill in the blanks. That, uh, this, is, this is maybe how I would approach it. So machine learning is very good for fitting patterns when you have established data and stuff like that. So you would use machine learning to estimate your cultural services and your carbon storage because you might not have actual data for all the areas and machine learning will do that. But when you actually want to um, optimize what you're going to do, um, I mean, you could apply, yeah, I mean, that, so that's where I think integer program optimization comes in. Like machine learning does fall under the umbrella of optimization because all statistics is um, optimization. Um, but it's, um, I see there's a lot of, um, it, it's just a different way of, um, it's not fitting a pattern, it's more like given a way of understanding things, how do you make, an, how do you identify the best thing to do? Does that make sense and answer your question? Yeah, <laughs> okay, great, and with that, I think we'll need to wrap it up. Thanks. Thanks.